Welcome to another episode of the IFC's Individuation Podcast. I'm Dr. Lahab El Samurai. With me today is the regular crew. They're all back and they're all happy to be here, except for some. Just kidding. Um, today, we're going to go into the image of the demonic sun, the shadow. So we're going to talk about the shadow um, in this episode. Uh, without further ado, we're going to get into the content. But first, just like uh, Dr. Eric and Dr. Lisa to say hello to everybody so they can hear your voice. Say hello, people. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. We have missed you. <laughs> yes, thank, I'm here. <laughs> thank you for gracing us with our audience. And well, thank, thank you, you audience. for welcoming me, be, welcoming me back. <laughs> yeah, thank you, audience, for well, helping me to welcome her back. <laughs> So today we're going to go into uh, a fairy tale uh, also uh, by our beloved brothers. Um, and we're going to go into the story of Puss and Boots, which has become a popular uh, animated series with uh, um, Shrek. With Shrek and uh, Donkey and all the others. So let's read the original story. Um, why don't we start with that? So Dr. Eric, you want to read the story? Sure, I can read it. Okay. There once was a miller who, when he died, left no more of his estate to his three sons than his mill, his mule and his cat. The eldest son got the mill, the second, the mule, and the youngest, nothing but the cat. The poor young fellow was quite comfortless at having received such a poor lot. My brothers, he said, my brothers, said he, may get their living handsomely enough by joining their stocks together. But for my part, when I have eaten up my cat, and made myself a muff from his skin, I must die of hunger. The cat, who heard all of this, but, <clears throat> but made out as if he had not, said to his new master with a grave and serious air, do not thus afflict yourself, my good master. You have nothing else to do but to give me a bag and get a pair of boots made for me that I may scamper through the dirt and brambles, and you shall see that you have not so bad a portion in me as you imagine. Now, when the cat had gotten what he had asked for, he booted himself very gallantly and putting his bag around his neck, he held the strings of it with his, in his two forepaws and went into a warren where there were many rabbits. Soon a rash and foolish young rabbit jumped into his bag and Monsieur Puss immediately drawing, drawing close the strings, took his bag and killed the contents without any pity. Proud of his prey, he went with it to the palace and asked to speak with his majesty. I have brought you, sir, a rabbit of the Warren, which my noble lord, the Marquis of Carabas, for that was the title which Puss was pleased to give his master, has commanded me to present to your majesty from him. Tell thy master, said the king, that I thank him and that he does me a great deal of pleasure. The cat continued for two or three months thus to carry his majesty from time to time game of his master's taking. One day he learned that the king was going to take his daughter for a walk on the riverbank. <clears throat> the cat arranged that the son of the miller should bathe in the river during this time. When his master was bathing, the cat screamed for help. The Marquis is drowning. Thieves have stolen his clothes. At this noise, the king put his head out of the coach window and finding it was the cat who had so often brought him such good game, he commanded his guards to run immediately to the assistance of his lordship, the Marquis of Carabas, and to fetch one of his best suits for him. The fine clothes he had been given set off his good mien extremely well. 
for he was well made and very handsome in person. So it was that the king's daughter took a secret inclination to him, and the Marquis of Carabas had no sooner cast two or three respectful and somewhat tender glances, but she fell in love with him to distraction. One time the king asked the Marquis to join him in his carriage. The cat ran ahead and told the mowers of a meadow and the reapers of a cornfield that when the king passed by and asked whose meadows and cornfields these belonged to, they should on their lives say the Marquis of Carabas. They did this and the king was quite impressed at the vast estates of my Lord Marquis of Carabas. Meanwhile, Monsieur Puss came at last to a stately castle, the master of which was an ogre, the richest ogre that ever had been known for all the lands which the king had then gone over actually belonged to him. Now the cat who had taken care to inform himself who this ogre was and what he could do asked to speak with him, saying he could not pass near it so near his castle without having the honor of paying his respects. The ogre received him as, civ as civilly as an ogre could do and made him sit down. The cat proceeded to trick the ogre into changing himself into a mouse. No sooner had Puss perceived that than he but fell upon the mouse and ate him up. Meanwhile, the king who saw as he passed this fine castle of the ogres had a mind to go in it, into it. Puss, who heard the noise of his master's coach, or his majesty's coach, rather, running over the drawbridge, bridge, ran out and said to the king, your majesty is welcome to this castle of my lord, Marquis of Carabas. What? My lord Marquis, cried the king. And does this castle also belong to you? There can be nothing finer than this court and all the stately buildings which surround us. Let us go into it if you please. His majesty was perfectly charmed with the good qualities of my lord Marquis of Carabas, as was his daughter, who had fallen violently in love with him. And seeing the vast estate he possessed, said to him, after having drunk five or six glasses, it will be owing to yourself only, my Lord Marquis, if you are not my son-in-law. The Marquis, making several low bows, accepted the honor which his majesty conferred upon him, and forthwith, that very same day, married the princess. Puss become a great, became a great lord and never ran after mice any more, but only for his diversion. So thus ends our story. So this is the story of Puss in Boots by the Grimm brothers as we started uh, the story. So uh, we're talking about the shadow and the shadow um, can also take a form of an animal. And that's what happens in this story. Um, she says in the, German, in the German version, which was only included in the first edition of the nursery and household tales of Brothers Grimm, the boy expresses a certain contempt when he hears the cat's request for boots. The German version has the boy saying, what, a decent pair of boots you want, just like other people? But then he sacrifices the last of his money for the boots. In the same version, it's also emphasized that Puss goes on two legs, just like a man, because he looks so strange and goes about like a man in boots that people fear him. And he becomes the head minister of his Lord. As the cat, the shadow, she says, shimmers between human and animal form and is otherwise not choosy in his means. Considering his boots, however, Puss is firmly on the ground, symbolizing a healthy instinct, a street savvy or cunning. As Jung pointed out with the animal symbol, we are dealing with an undisciplined, undifferentiated, and not yet humanized part of the libido which still possesses the compulsive character of an instinct, a part still untamed by domestication. 
The animal symbol points specifically to the extra human, the transpersonal, for the contents of the collective unconscious are not only the residues of the archaic, she says, specifically human modes of functioning, but also the residues of functioning from man's animal ancestry. This, this meaning as untamed, impulsive, instinctual, driven nature, and at the same time, superpersonal character explains the apparently odd behavior of the puss in the fairy tale. This particular character emphasizes the earth side boots with supernatural powers and connection to fraud, deceit, and all in the services of the Miller's son. To the extent the son represents ego consciousness, this portrayal represents the ego as being fairly weak and col colorless. This is complemented from his unconscious by a perky cat. The acquisition of the boots is a conscious turning to the symphonic realm. The gift to the king are insufficient efforts as long it is the shadow who procures and presents them. That is why the cat forces the hero to bathe in the river, to be immersed in the magical element and thus to experience a complete self-emptying and nakedness. From then on, his ascent begins and the animal in him overcomes the evil power step by step. Mowers, reapers, and ogres that had possessed all the goods without letting becoming part of the young man's potential ability to use them in order to come into life. Just as they had not been available to his late father. So the shadow figure creates a psychological safe situation in which he can take command of his inner realm and resources in harmony with the princess. Now Puss, the cat fades into the background or as in the German version, takes a second place. It's an interesting story. So that's what the cat represents. We've had all kinds of projections for cats throughout history. Archetypally, they carry a lot of <clears throat> um, almost human-like abilities. They also have like magical powers. They have nine lives. Yeah, they tend to be much more multidimensional than than dogs do. Although I love dogs too, and started out with them yeah. as a kid, but but uh, cats are they just have some other element to them that's I don't know, and we've a, and we've attributed it to supernatural qualities, mm. but it's something in the spiritual realm that they kind of tend to tie into for us they used to they 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 are they are part of ancient religions and ancient empires had cats cats were looked as as even um like you said have a magical quality and archetype yeah. type of energy uh, that has this power so he is unable to see his potential beyond turning the cat into a hat and eating it. Uh, the cat explains to this uh, naive, almost st stupid kid who is going to eat the cat what the what the potential is of not eating it, what it can do for him. Well, the first thing you'd ask him to do is, is to buy a pair of boots. Well, and I think in a, in a right along with what you're saying, it is um, the idea that if that's another part of himself, then this kid, this this immature, innocent-minded kid uh, is looking at this other part of himself and thinking there's just not much worth to it. Mm. And I think a lot of people look at their shadow self 
once they begin to understand a little bit what the shadow self is, and they initially just view it from a negative point of view only, and or from a point of view that says, even if I understand it, what good's it going to do me? Mm. When there is a tremendous amount we can learn and grow from of ourselves by learning about our shadow mm. it has a lot more value than most people would think that it does. Well, in the story, it saves his life. It saves the cat's life. It enriches the king somehow. It gives him the ability to enjoy himself. And then um, it finds a husband for the princess at the same time. So the shadow in a lot of ways is doing all these things that this kid didn't have any ambition in doing. Right. Yeah. So he he, was, mm-hmm. Go on, yeah. go on, Lisa. Young, he's young, he's literal. Uh, he... Um, does not see beyond practicalities it's pedestrian it's um, and he doesn't um, take a take risks or create um, new avenues he just sees a cat Um, but in the end he does see great value Eric or else why he gave he trusted this cat an instinct uh, a quiet drive a something something alluring there that he invested his last coppers to give this cat a demand gave it boots you drive you show me the road you start walking i'll follow and he gave the cat the boots and so he gave his shadow the lead and say okay i'm in, i'm i'm gonna let this go and i'm gonna say you you know what it is that i need and i need to follow you and this cat um used other thing other um aspects incorporating the young man for the ultimate benefit of the young man to increase his land and his value and his worth um, towards an ultimate uh, fairy tale ending no I, I, that's well stated well said glad you're back <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh he did he did come around at first though he he didn't see worth in himself He had to have a conversation with himself. He had to have a conversation with the cat, with his shadow. And then he realized that, okay, maybe I don't need to just be eating him and making shoes out of him. (laughs) And and so, again, it's that what I was getting to a few minutes ago, it's that understand. I'm, I'm speaking mainly toward Americans here, Western Christianity in general which is what America is. It's changing quickly, but it's still predominantly a Western Christian society. And and it's just very, very easy to view the shadow as if it's the sinful nature. Lots of people get them, they, they think the shadow is kind of like our sinful nature side. It's kind of like our id, except with evil intentions. And it's not what it is. It's just not what it is. And I'm thrilled about this story showing that there's more to it than our shadow, our dark side is just something evil that we can't talk about and, and, and integrate ourselves with. Mm-hmm. And Lahab, Dr. Lahab, what's that famous saying that Carl Jung says? Uh, It's one of my favorite in here. I can't think of it. When he talks about we don't get rid of the darkness with with imagining shadows of light and all that, but we have to to integrate the shadow with our other self. We can't just get rid of it by praying it away or by pretending that it's, it's something that hurts us. No, we're supposed to integrate it. Well, it does hurt. I mean, the shadow is, uh, is aspects of us that we do not identify with. And so yeah. the more disassociated we are from it and the further it's beyond our conscious awareness, where the cat is in this kid's conscious awareness and it's creating this consciousness, the first thing that it does is it asks for boots. 
which connect it to the earth, but it also uh, gives it a aura of um, importance. It gives it an identity. The boots give this cat something that no other cat has. So no other person has. So once he's able to do that, then he's acknowledged that his shadow might know something he does not. And a lot of the stories, um, going back to what you were saying, Eric, a lot of the stories of, of kids who uh, befriend animals and the animal in ways protects them um, in the wild, in different places, because the animal knows the aspects of uh, nature that the ego does not. So, yeah, there's even been cat and dog lovers that have been that have been had physical illnesses sniffed out of them from their pet and went and got correct. checked out, and sure enough, they had something very deadly. Correct. So they could see the connection with the animal. They could see the connection with this this spirit. And the animal has a spirit, so they could connect to that spirit. In this story, the cat acts um, as the mature part of the child. It, it is able to negotiate. It kills the rabbit, takes it to the king, tells it this is this amazing rabbit that only people eat is rabbit. <clears throat> but when it takes it into the kingdom, it basically gives a sacrifice to the king. Mm. And that sacrifice um, makes the king look twice onto this cat in boots. And so the cat takes a bigger aura suddenly now because it was able to do that. Because that's thinking away from I have no power. You know, so so this kid feels like he has no power except uh, against this cat. And so the cat is showing him that there's that power can be achieved in different ways. So, yeah, in this case, the shadow is deceitful. It is a con artist at the same time, mm -hmm. but it's also in survival mode. It's also trying to survive this kid that's trying to eat it. It's not trying to run away from it, it's facing it. So it is, it is a part of this kid, it's connected to the kid. Um, even the cat is unconscious of the connection to the kid because if the cat has so much influence with the king, he could just walk away. Um, why do you need to have a master? Um, the cat figured out that, no, oh, they're not gonna take me seriously, just pretend there's somebody else in charge that I am part of a bigger organization, <laughs> that I am not the only CEO. So this cat has figured that out very quickly. And so suddenly it has, um, it has gotten into the graces of the king, but it has actually deceived everybody around it, mm -hmm. right? So always remember that the shadow does the following. It amazes, it holds, it holds your attention, it holds your gaze, and you don't know exactly what it is. So always remember the shadow is impressive. It's not, uh, it's not like a horror movie where it runs out of the room covered in blood holding a chainsaw. It's cunning, it's smooth, it's, um, it makes you feel that you're safe, even when you're in danger. It also at times make you feel like you have the power and choice, but it's actually moving and it's the shadow's benefit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, exactly what, go on, Lisa. 
um, in in the part of the story in the ogre. He convinced the ogre to change form. Now that is some yeah. power. Yeah. <laughs> and the ogre chose to change itself into a mouse when he's talking to a cat. Now, what kind of person does that? <laughs> yeah, but that's what the shadow does. Shadow. That's shadow. what the shadow does. It takes your money while you're sitting there. It says, it's your money. I, I don't want to take it from you. No, you have to take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to. <laughs> you know, it's like an imperative. I can't believe I gave that person my money. And I implore them to take it on top of it. And that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just part of the ego that may not want to admit that it does or is capable yeah. of plans out where it seems um, um, not um, not uh, within the boundaries of conduct. Yeah, and then we talk about it, I think we've talked about it in several of our podcasts, but we talk about it always is that the um, our evolution as a species, we have developed many different ways of adaption and survival, they might not always be necessary for us. That doesn't mean we don't have access to them. Those aspects that are not necessary for our survival does not mean they don't end up somewhere. The shadow takes all those pieces. Oh, you're not wanted. You belong with me. They don't value you, you belong with me. And it's another aspect of, it's a defense mechanism, right? The shadow is the, is the last line of defense. Mm -hmm. It is when you, it is, uh, it is when you commit the ultimate act, you, you cut off your foot to, uh, because it's stuck and you're about to drown. It's the one that has you saw through the foot to get out not to be too um, graphic, but it is that part of us that uh, will survive no matter what. We'll tell you to do whatever you have to do. Ask questions later, just do it. That is the shadow. The shadow is always there. The shadows. And for those who are dissociated or in denial of their shadows, their shadows are running amok. Everybody around them sees it. Yeah. Everybody sees them acting out um, either out of pain or rage or um, feeling deceived. They see it, um, but the person, when they look in the mirror, is like, well, I don't see it. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't do anything to anybody. I don't know why anybody does wants to talk about me in that way. That's why everybody not... calls me shady exactly <laughs> why they call me shady you know i think one thing that that has always fascinated me about the relationship i was going to say battle but it's really not a battle necessarily the relationship between our conscious side that we have with our conscious mind and our shadow that is the shadow, to me, if I don't use the shadow for good, it will use me. It will, it will trick me. It will, I will be tricked by it if I don't see what it's doing and then pluck out the good that it's providing for me in terms of information or understanding or uh, self-protective interactions with something or a situation or somebody but the minute that i try to view it as my enemy and the moment i try to out slick it and outsmart it and defeat it because i'm not going to let something in me you know control me like that i'm going to kick its butt and when when you have that kind of attitude you usually lose you usually end up in jail yeah 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 because basically you're denying an aspect of yourself that can can be very very destructive yes so i would uh to continue what you're saying 
Um, so something that's destructive, if you pretend it doesn't exist, then you're setting yourself up for that day. You're setting yourself up for something destructive to happen because you are saying that I am blind to me, that I am blind to the possibility of me. That's what you're saying. You're saying there's an aspect of me I don't care about that should not be considered. The fact of the matter is it's always in the conversation. It doesn't matter what you say. The <laughs> shadow is always in the conversation. And it's always moving the conversation along. And when it doesn't like what you say, it, it cracks a joke that blows everything you say out of the water. You say, oh my God, why would you say that? <laughs> it was like, well, I didn't mean it. Well, no, the yeah. shadow meant it. You might have not meant it. The shadow meant it to say it, you know. It's the part where it's the um, is the part where it doesn't think a relationship is good enough for you, so it's going to say something really detrimental to the relationship, and then you're going to keep telling yourself, "I can't believe I said that. Why would I say that? I can't believe I said that," because the shadow is saying, "I want this over. I don't want to continue in this relationship. You want to continue in this relationship. This is a bad idea for me. I don't like it." <clears throat> It is. It is always there. That's why I was it's laughing when you said that. I'm going, oh my God, I'll never always forget. There. And and forgive me for bringing this up. I don't think it's a bad idea to bring it up. But I remember one night, the three of us were getting ready to have a podcast. And we were all feeling kind of, you know, kind of loose. And it was a long day and all that. And, and we just started, you know, chipping, chipping and jabbering at one another. And the next thing you know, I, I think our shadows got involved in it. Oh, we were all sure. laughing. It was funny, but it got so much that we decided, hey, wait a minute. We're, we're a little out of control here. We, we need to have this podcast on another night. Well, yeah, because because aspects, because we... Y'all remember that? Yeah, well, you, I, I think that was that was a day where we hooked each other. And when you yeah. hook each other, you don't know how to get out at that point. The only way is to stop the conversation. <laughs> but nobody wants to stop the conversation. Oh, I want to talk about it some more. Well, you don't really want to talk about it anymore because it's just going to get worse at that point. Because at that point, there's like there's nothing coming out of me that makes sense anymore. Now, all that's coming out of me is me being incensed with the situation. I'm incensed with it. So no matter what I say, I'm going to just talk about being incensed even more and more and more. And then it starts like pushing you to a different level. Now, if you are with enemies or people who are potentially threatening to you, that's a very important skill to have because that keeps them weary of you. Yes. It keeps them from attacking you it, because you have this sense of yourself and you get louder and more anxiety and you more irritated. And so the other person was like, yeah, maybe we should mess with this person there. It's the problem is when you can't, when you don't access it and it plays dead for you, then it messes you up. If you become very passive towards it, then it messes you up. Then it puts you in situations where you're hurt and um, you get no relief from it because you're not learning your lesson. You're not learning that you need to stand up. It's telling you you need to stand up and you're not learning from it, so it keeps slapping you down. So sooner or later, you're going to stand up to me, Right. What was so amazing to me, Dr. Lahab, about it was one of the things that was so amazing to me is that before before we ended our conversation or whatever it was for the evening, we all were talking about what had just happened <laughs> and kind of I mean, it was just like kind of funny to me at how we can we can actually look at it, talk about it. And none of us have any bad feelings toward one another. We just all three recognized. But at the time, it was very hot. Well, it was. But at I, the time, it felt like the stove was on fire. At the time, at the it time, it felt like it could destroy things. It could destroy relationships. 
It could destroy other things. I mean, that's that's the shadow when it's like coming alive inside of us. That's what it feels like. It's a, it's a powerful thing. You could feel it. You could sense it. It's in your skin. You start saying things like, I don't care right away. And you know that shadow. Yeah. As soon as you say, I don't care. <laughs> right? Because then you're basically saying that it doesn't matter who you guys are. I don't care. Like our relationship doesn't matter anymore. I've crossed that bridge. <laughs> That's what becomes scary. Lisa, you were going to... There, there is a tone that can get almost obsessive Ooh. about a um, driving your point or what, what are you get obsessed Continue with the conversation. That. Yeah, during the conversation yeah. where um, what it is that you're saying or Eric, I, I, the underlying faith of the continuity of the group goes yeah. out the window. You totally forget about it because you're yeah. so incensed and obsessed with that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, but the aftermath, when we did wind down, Eric, I, I completely agree. We we're all like, okay, that was over. Um, we'll just let that, we'll, we'll sort yeah. that out on our own. We got caught up and I'm glad that we are able to. There is also a sense when you get through that dark and come back into presence, being present again, <laughs> that y'all go, oh, okay, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's clearly a victory and, and an important one. And and what because at that point in time, it was obvious that none of us were going to, none of us, I don't think, would have allowed that to do any kind of long term destruction of our relationship. Well, so you have to remember that we we're talking about what this book, this book is entirety is about the shadow aspect of humanity. So the trigger was already there. It's in our hands. Yeah. We read it out. We talk about it incessantly. We converse about it. And then we act like we're above it. And that's the mistake. The mistake yeah. is you're not above the material. You are the material. The material is you. Yeah. And so to, to talk about, to mess with the shadows, you're messing with an archetype. When you mess with the shadow, when you mess with the shadow, there is an archetype. We're not talking about the shadow as a complex for you. There's an archetype. It's called the shadow. And that archetype represents the devil, the betrayer. It also represents, it represents many different aspects of what we find to be on the wrong side or the other side. Let's put it the other side. So this is the other side. When you mess with it, when you say, put some boots, I mean, come on, who believes this shit? So when you mess with it, it messes back. You can't mess with it. You can't like sit there and try to clinically poke at it. Oh, the shadow moves from right to left. No, it moves you from right to left. It doesn't move from right to left. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful of the power you awaken, right? So it's always the case. Is be, be careful what you wish for. You want to know more? Okay, great. Let me show you, right? And when you talk about that conversation, it doesn't matter how far back you could go. You don't remember. I don't remember. I don't know where that thread started. We don't know where that thread started because it's in the material. It's in our head. We're reading it. We're talking about it, reflecting on it. We had read those stories. There were two stories at that day. We had read them over and over again. And if you remember reading the story, you will find what started it in the story. Yeah, the shot, it yeah. was triggered before we got so Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> 100%, 100,000%. It was triggered way before we arrived. It was triggered. It was already there when we were laughing. It was laughing. Yeah. Yeah. The archetype was laughing. It's like, oh, you guys are having a good time. Okay, good. That's where we went. That's the, that's the good beginning point. That's why, that's why so many bar 
fun nights become disasters. Yes. Because what starts out as really funny, oh, you're so funny. Oh, you made fun of me. That's funny. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, now I feel offended. <laughs> and so it, it escalates very quickly yeah. to something is like, oh, this has gotten out of hand. <clears throat> so when we talk about archetypal energies, you know, we're messing with something. You have to understand what you're messing with. You have to understand what you're talking about. Because when you dive into material that is like this material, which is, you know, depth psychology, basically. Uh, so Nietzsche says that when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back. And we're staring into the unconscious every week, over and over again. The unconscious stares back. Oh, who are these three? And what do they think they're doing? Uh, so it stares back at you. So this is what happens in uh, groups, great bands. The shadow appears. First, it's money. It's like, well, you make more than I do. Why do you make more than I do? Then it's power. It's like, well, you make more decisions than I do. Then it's about adulation. Well, how do you measure that? Oh, no, you get a lot more. That's because you stand in front of the group. That's because you get to write the songs. That's because I don't get to say much. And suddenly, it, like, and then it runs through the entire group. You can start feeling the trembling and it trembles out. Because what, there, what happens is the archetypal energy is the shadow. It's an archetypal energy. Like the mother is an archetypal energy, like the father. Where does the shadow appear? This is an old woman in the woods. Turns out to be a witch. An old beggar who has nothing to eat. Um, a wolf who seems to be hurt. So it takes on different forms in, in life. A politician who always smiles. It takes on different forms. The shadow starts to show itself. Right? And even when it's in your face and telling you, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to mess with you in ways you do not understand. You're like, really? That's great. Because you're caught. You're caught in its web. There's a show, um, it's about grifters. Um, it's on Prime. There's an English version, there's an American version. The American version is called Hustle. The English version, I think is also called Hustle. Anyway, but they are immersed in the activities of the shadow. Uh, but their idea is that they try to right wrongs by using the power of deception. They try to help people by deceiving other people who have hurt them, who have more power than them. So it's all about aspects of the shadow. What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? But even their like understanding of the shadow is like, is, as long as the person who we're hurting has hurt somebody. But this is the archetypal energy. The archetypal energy of retribution, of revenge. That's the shadow. Of, of blood. Of a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. That's the shadow. It's, very, it's a very primitive drive and instinct. And it's a self-preserving instinct yeah. to drive. It's an absolutely, it has preserved us from each other. It has preserved us over, I mean, we, become, we became this, uh, we became the dominant creatures on this planet, not by accident. We either ate, destroyed, killed, hunted, or basically imprisoned every single other creature that could 
haunt us. I mean, this is why uh, when a virus pops up, we are like space cadets. We don't see our shadow. We, we, don't, we don't recognize it. So when it comes out in a virus, oh no, where did that come from? Well, they, we, that exists with us like everything else does. We have always existed. This is why, you know, this like denying death, like, oh, death, you know, it's like, we don't need to talk about it. It's, it's only people who die. It's like talking about war. Oh, you know, it was a, <clears throat> what do they call it? It was an engagement. It was not a war. <laughs> it was a military action. It was not a war. We don't want to acknowledge our shadow. We don't want to acknowledge how, grand our shadow is and how much of the world that it eats up this is, uh, you know uh and, and dr lahab i think the military is probably the best example of that because i one time i went through all of the words that they created new mm. words or phrases mm. that they create for things mm. Uh, like engagement as opposed to battle or war. And the majority of the new terms, the new words, ne neologisms, I think is what they're called, but the majority of those words had to, had to do with death and destruction, but the words became almost neutral. Yeah. They were almost neutral words describing horrible destruction and killing yeah i mean this is how you get away with it this is how the shadow gets away with it it didn't hurt everybody i mean it helps some people that's that's how you get away with it this is how you rationalize mass destruction this is this is how you rationalize poisoning the food supply well it didn't hurt everybody i mean yeah some people had cancer but you know mostly people survived and we have a lot more food and more people are fed and who cares if it's a little poisonous. This is how they rationalize yeah. mass murder. This is how they've rationalized the destruction of this planet. This is how they've rationalized hunting um, other species into oblivion. This is how they rationalize it. They rationalize it over and it's always the archetypal energy of the shadow. The shadow stands very, very strong. It's like if there is anything that we learned from the past administration is that when the shadow is dancing around in front of you on a daily basis, the things that will come out are things that would blow you away. The Chinese, it was like, this is a new article. It's a clip of a book. Uh, one of Trump's generals had to call the Chinese to let them know that we weren't going to attack them. So he would stay in power because the Chinese saw we we're going to attack them. Because the shadow is talking all kinds of crap all the time. All the time. And people are clinging to it. It's like a magnet. It's pulling all these fringe parts into the middle to create this and even those who reject its premise are being pulled into the middle. Yeah. So it's, it, it's like a ticking time bomb that's pulling everything towards you and blows up. I mean, it's the, uh, one of the best uh, depictions of the shadow is uh, the Batman, uh, Batman against the Joker. It is the best depiction because Batman is sitting across from the Joker and the Joker is laughing at him, telling him he is, he is the same, but he is more efficient. And the Batman is just slow at figuring it out, that he's just figured it out. They are one. That they are both their own shadows personified. Yes, that they, they're, they're both acting out of the same premise. Mm -hmm. That they come from the same egg. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying to me. Yeah. That we were born of the same egg. Mm -hmm. You are saying that you do it differently, but we're doing the same thing. Mm 
You're trying to stop something that's going to happen anyway. You're just delaying it. Even it's basically he's implying that he is actually more sadistic than the Joker. He says, you, you're just prolonging the pain. There's this long, um, we should actually, we should, uh, we should analyze that movie. Yeah. There's a long monologue between them when he catches the Joker and the Joker I, is, has this entire building with people um, uh, strapped bombs onto. And as they're having this conversation, uh, he's trying to figure out where this is so he could save them. And so they're having this long monologue about who's who, who's righteous, who's the Batman is always in doubt. But even Batman cannot survive without digging into the shadow. He basically took on the persona of the shadow. He took in the form of a bat. He hides in the shadows. He comes from the shadows. He's scary like something that comes from the shadows. <clears throat> Where here, the Joker is like a happy clown that's gone a little psychotic. But in the, in the story, in the story of the Joker, in his movie, he's a, he's a bullied kid. He's a continuously bullied kid. And then a bullied adult. And he snaps. He's not like an evil mastermind or just, he snaps. But that's something that's very similar between him and Batman. They both snap. I like that you said that <clears throat> you know, they're split, but there's parts of themselves in both characters. Yeah. And and uh, I know it's kind of an old show and kind of uh, silly to some people now, but the original Star Trek series with Roddenberry had an episode where Kirk split into a good Kirk and a bad Kirk. Mm. And it just brilliantly showed that episode brilliantly showed that oh my gosh, there's there's a lot of good strength, there's a lot of good energy or energy. I won't call it good energy. Energy is just energy. But you could see, oh, there's a lot of energy in this bad Kirk that with under the right decision making processes and understanding, that can be very powerful for a person. And then in the reverse was also true. You, you were seeing the weaker Kirk and he was losing the ability to make decisions. He was, wasn't, he lost his confidence. He, he only thought of these ultra good things. And, and it's like, oh my gosh, there's weaknesses that are contained in pure goodness alone that I need to watch out for too. It was guess, an amazing guess, episode. Guess, guess who wrote that episode? I don't know. <laughs> the archetype. It always oh. writes the episode. It always tells you, well, look at you. You are weak without me. Look at you. You're almost nothing. You have no energy. You have nothing here. I can't even put makeup on you. You don't look like a human being. Look at you. You look like a fool. And suddenly you're like, see all this energy there's a vitality to it there's an aggression to it right kirk was really like strong and aggressive very masculine there's a very yeah it's exaggerated in a lot of ways but this is sure. what the shadow this is what the shadow does it's this is what is the aspect of the shadow it's like oh i i'm scary right you know people are scared of me i have power people are not scared of you you have no power that's the first thing it says off the bat. It tells you, it's like, oh, they're not scared of you. That's the problem. It's always diagnosing problems for you, always. It's always telling you what and where you should and what you shouldn't be doing. Even though there is an edge to it, there's a twinge, and that's why you have to become conscious of it. 
because yes. that twinge becomes it's like a it's an annoying small sound that becomes a very loud annoying sound it will drive you in those directions it'll sever relationships it will um kill any type of uh good feeling with other people it want to put you into because it's a complex and it wants to be energized it wants more energy. It wants to take over. It doesn't want to sit in the darkness. It wants to sit in the light. It says, well, you know, I want to be king of both kingdoms. It's the, it's the, it's the original story, right? I want to sit on top of both kingdoms. Why can't I sit those? Mm -hmm. What does the devil tell um, um, Al Pacino and uh, Keanu Reeves in The Devil's Advocate? They what have this long conversation. There's this huge, long monologue between them. He's like, I was here on day one. I am the one who does the dirty work. You think he gets his hands dirty? I got my hands dirty. I am the one. I am the one who made all of this. I am the one who... So that's the argument that uh, the archetype uses. The archetype is like, you would have never survived without me. I led you to squash all these other creatures. I led you to spray all these other insects and poison your own food. I led your fear. <laughs> I let you kill yourself. I didn't do that for anybody else. <clears throat> and I am leading you off the edge of the cliff right now. We are driven by like the shadow energy that's destroying this planet. And it rationalizes itself by, well, how are we going to eat? We're not going to have enough to eat. So we've had enough to eat for centuries. Suddenly we're going to run out of food. Well, then we can't fly. Then we can't walk. Then it's like all these things that we've been doing over and over again. Without destroying. We were literally at a stage and our development that the archetypal shadow is no longer seen as something evil. It is worship. It's like, oh yeah, good for you. Take more. That's where we are in human history right now. The shadow has prevailed. Unfortunately, the fight goes on, but the shadow in a lot of ways has prevailed yeah and it and and over a long period of time because we've spent centuries trying to beat it down and put handcuffs on it and not listen to it and ignore it and and call it so evil you even the thought of it is a sin yeah but it has caused the opposite effect well yeah of course it's caused it's caused the Catholics to run after people and burn them, burn them to a crisp, calling yeah. them witches. And it's, it's caused so much destruction. It's, it's basically what, what's happened is, is that it's become, it's become okay. That somehow it's okay. It's okay to be a little evil. And that's where um, the infection begins and that's where it ends. Yeah. It's almost like it's becoming a little bit visible. Well, it is visible. It's everywhere. It's visible. I mean, as its own entity. Well, yeah. I mean, people are like basking in it. They're making up their own truths or half truths. Yeah. They're they're creating their own narratives. They're creating their own. They're creating a world uh, based on deception and lies, and and it's okay because everything we say is a lie. That's the rationale they've been using. That it's everybody's truth. Everybody has a truth. They even got the the far left liberals saying shit like that. Everybody has a truth. On the one hand, they do, but that is that term. 
that term opens up the gates of hell. Yeah. The far right is using the same term. Yes, both sides are. Those, those are the openings. Anyway, so much. As for Lisa would listen. say, as Lisa would say, we're getting yeah. a little too dark. I was okay, say, let's I let's was, lighten yeah. up the mood a little bit. Thank you, Lisa. You're in our heads. I was thinking the same thing. <clears throat> well, what, um, what what a what a tale Puss in Boots can get into, though. Huh? Yes, 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 absolutely. A little cat dragged us, a little cat in boots dragged us all the way into the end of the world. Now we have to step away and hope that our idea, our energies can push us away from the edge. Yes. There's always time. Oh, we just all love to talk about all of ourselves. All the time. <laughs> It's great to see you guys. And uh, so, uh, Lisa, Eric, uh, next week, we continue with uh, the image of the demonic sun, the shadow. And hopefully, we will still be here next week. <laughs> hopefully, the shadow hasn't gotten to us. <laughs> we will be here for part two. We'll do part two of the demonic sun, the shadow. And um, but you know what, Lahab? Yes. Talking about the shadow, I just have one thing to say to it. Yes. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. <laughs> I am not afraid. <laughs> we are not afraid. And we will be back next week <laughs> with the IFC's Individuation Podcast. Thank you for being with us here today. Until Thank you. next week. Until next time.